Hello, and welcome to the Alex webinar on the big, the weird, and the bulky, housing solutions for objects in library and archival collections. I'm Felicity Dykus, a member of the Alex Continuing Education Committee, and I'll be your host today. Our presenters are Laura McCain and Angela Andres. Laura is the conservation librarian in the Barbara Goldsmith Preservation and Conservation Department of New York University. Her library degree is from Long Island University, and she has a master's degree in paper conservation. Angela is the special collections conservator in that same department at New York University. She also has a bachelor's degree in fine arts and printmaking, and a library degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So you can see they have a lot of experience in this area. There are a few things to keep in mind for today's presentation. All attendees are muted. So, and if you want to chat, we don't have a chat feature in our software, but you can use Twitter, and there's the hashtag. We're not going to monitor that Twitter feed, so if you have questions, please type them into the question box, and Laura and Angela will answer them at the end of their presentation. Questions which we don't get to will be answered offline, and we'll send you all the answers. This webinar is being recorded. So you'll get a copy of the webinar, the presentation slides, and an evaluation within two days. And now, here's Laura. There'll be a slight delay as we change speakers. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for attending this webinar. The goal of this webinar is to introduce the methods and materials we use at NYU Libraries to house non-traditional objects from our special collections. Uh, before we dive into the, our presentation, we wanted to conduct a poll and ask you uh, what types of objects, you know, if you have some of the same types of objects that we're going to be talking about. And these include rolled objects, button pins or badges, panoramic photographs, framed paintings, and important person's personal effects. And the poll has now been open. And when we talk about important personal, important person's personal effects, that can range from uh, someone's pen to a shovel in our experience, or even, um, you know, I think that we have some life-size busts in our collection. Wow, that's great to see. So it looks like we're pretty on target for some of the things we're going to be talking about today. I'll give a little bit more time. Okay. Okay, I think we're going to move. Our methods and materials that we use have been developed and determined over the last eight years and have been influenced by our colleagues both at NYU Libraries and in many other museums, libraries, and archives, as well as by publications and resources. Um, on this slide are a few resources we thought might be particularly helpful. Um, the American Institute of Conservation supports a number of collection care resources. Their um, collection Care Network, CCN in particular, is committed to developing resources about storage techniques. It is a relatively new um, part of AIC, and this year they launched a thing called STASH, um, Storage Techniques for Art, Science, and History. It's a very new resource, and um, it was created as a collaborative effort between CCN and also a group called Spinach, which is a Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections, and it was supported by the Crest Foundation. Um, the first items that will be in STASH come from a really uh, popular and frequently consulted publication that was, came out in 1992, and many of you may know it. It's called The Storage of Natural History Collections, Ideas, and Practical Solutions. Um, also from AIC on their conservation wiki is the Preventive Care wiki pages, which are being developed by CCN. But also to keep in mind is that there are many um, pages that are created by the specialty groups that also include information about housing and definitely are worth 
um, consulting. Some of the specialty group pages, such as paper in particular, are really robust, while others are really under development. So keep in mind if you go to, you know, to check them in, in the future, because they may be underdeveloped. Um, CCI, the Canadian Conservation Institute, uh, document caring for objects and collections is a very useful resource for information about materials and storage techniques, as well as other conservation and collection information. CCAHAs, which is the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, document called the Selecting Storage Materials is a really nice, concise guide to different types of materials that are appropriate to fabricate housings, and it's a really great resource to send out. Um, PACIN, which I have listed on the bottom, is an interesting uh, information network that is called Preparation, Art Handling, and Collection Care Information Network. I found some really helpful information from, on their website about housing, particularly about crating, transportation, exhibition. And um, the National Park Service Conservograms is a resource we use a lot. Um, these conservograms are really practical publications, and they describe a really wide variety of materials, um, which has been really helpful to us, because I think within the National Park Service collections, they have such diversity. And um, you'll see descriptions of storage and mounting techniques, as well as uh, other information that can be helpful. When planning the housing of objects, we consider these three factors equally, use or anticipated use, and in addition to the frequency of use, we consider the type of use. At NYU Libraries, as in many university special collections, we have classrooms attached to our special collections that are frequently used for both undergraduate and graduate classes. The housing needs of an object frequently used for teaching is very different than an object that is infrequently used by specialized researchers. Objects that are frequently used in teaching must be easily accessible, and we aim to develop housings that allow for display with minimal or no manipulation of the object. You will see some examples of housings for objects used frequently in teaching towards the end of our presentation. The composition of the object, particularly the materials that the object is composed of, as well as the size and weight of the object, are key factors in housing design. And of course, the condition. The amount of internal and external supports the object requires within its housing is determined by both the materials it's made of and the condition of those materials and how they're interacting with one another. At NYU Libraries, also, we have to consider our serious space limitations, and therefore we aim to reduce the footprint of housings whenever possible. We try to use standard size boxes that fit our particular shelving systems. We avoid odd-shaped boxes, as in our experience at NYU Libraries, they're often misshelved, which can result in inefficient use of space or more seriously, increased risk of damage from improper stacking. In addition, NYU Libraries does not currently have art storage, such as hanging storage or bin storage, commonly used for storing framed artworks. So we've had to develop housing solutions for framed materials in addition to other types of objects, and we're going to describe some of those solutions for framed objects um, in the webinar today. So before we talk about specific examples of housing, we wanted to give an overview of the, the materials that we use and the tools that we use. And um, this is a list of all the supplies that you know, were used to make all of the housings that will be described in this webinar. Um, and you can see it, it's a pretty comprehensive list and includes both you know, paper-based materials and also plastics, but also some hardware, S-hooks, magnets, rope, cotton tying tape. And you may notice that there's quite a few plastics in this list, such as uh, Coroplast Archival, Valara, Ethophone, Tyvek, polyester sheets, and polyethylene bags. These materials can be very useful in constructing housings. However, some caution is advised. Some concerns relate to the impact these materials may have on the environment and human health. Some materials, particularly Valara and Ethophone, are very hard to recycle. And while recycled content containing ethafoam has been developed and is available, it's not widely available from vendors, um, conservation, or library archival supply vendors. Although I am aware that some vendors are considering supplying ethafoam made re with recycled content. When, when, cutting hot, when cutting plastics, if you're using a heated tool, compounds are released that can adversely impact both the environment and human health. To reduce these risks, we avoid hot cutting of plastics. We use cold cutting whenever possible, and if we do need to use a heated tool, 
we minimize the heat and wear personal protective equipment. In addition to these environmental and health concerns, there are some concerns about how these plastics, particularly Tyvek, interacts with other materials that might be inside of the objects, such as objects that contain PVC. In general, we avoid using plastics in our housings or our adhesives when we are housing any type of objects that contain PVC plastics or other plastics that are in poor condition. Sometimes we don't actually know the type of plastic that the object may be made out of, and if we see any type of deterioration, we really think differently about our housing options. I'll give you an example. It was in the housing of a collection of deteriorated plastic stencils. These stencils were, uh, had become embrittled. There was obviously some of the plasticizer was, was coming out of it. And in creating the housing for those objects, we only used unbuffered board and tissue. We no, used no adhesives whatsoever in the housing. So when in doubt, we personally just rely on unbuffered, acid-free, lignin-free papers and boards, or unbleached, unsized cotton, linen or cotton threads, and cotton ties. Also, whenever possible, we try to opt for pressure fitting in our housing, or folding, um, or using sewing over using PVA or hot milk glues, especially when the objects contain plastics or very sensitive media. So here's a list of the tools. We talked about the supplies, and here's the tools now that we use to construct the housings that we will be presenting in our webinar. And you know, these are pretty standard tools, you know, phone folders, knives, scissors, etc. Some of the other nice-to-haves may be um, the you know, the impulse heat sealer can be very useful. The hot knife with attachments for cutting epifoam is very useful. Um, and, you know, a sewing machine. Angela has one at home, so we, we utilize that. Um, I just want to point out the picture on the right of the safety cutting guide. This is something that we purchased about a year ago. It's not inexpensive, but I really just wanted to kind of give it a shout out because we found it to be much safer when cutting heavy boards than standard straight edges and very easy to use. We have a lot of students in our lab and, you know, it's important to have things that are easy to use and very safe. And I have to say that this tool has actually become very popular with the conservators and the students alike. So it was a really good investment for our lab. All the tools and supplies, with the exception of the sewing machine, which I already mentioned, that all were purchased from these four vendors. Um, and in addition to these vendors, there's many other great vendors that supply these materials. Um, these are just the ones that we particularly used, and, and our choice of vendor, just so you know, I make that clear, is partially determined by NYU's purchasing department and our policies here. Um, we're a large organization, so again, uh, you know, the, the vendors that were not listed there, it's not any kind of comment on that. There's a lot of great vendors out there. Also, many of our materials are purchased at a hardware store nearby. I do want to mention that we do not purchase our Tyvek from the hardware store, though because um, Tyvek that is sold for house wraps often has other coatings that would be not appropriate to use for objects. We really make sure that we're buying our plastics directly from suppliers that are ensuring that they don't have extra coatings on them. So I'm going to begin describing some of our more simple housing solutions, and then as we progress into more complex solutions, Angela is going to take over from me. So here is an image of our simple rolled storage system. These are 4.5 inch diameter acid-free lignin-free rolls that have a variety of objects rolled around them, including in this example, a theater backdrop, a set of architectural drawings, and some oversized artworks. These items were far too large for our oversized flat file storage, and the use level for these objects was determined to be infrequent. So we developed a system for low-use storage that utilizes the metal caged exteriors of our special collection stacks, which I think you can see the stacks through there with our call number slips standing out. And we, this is just one area where we have these, we've utilized this caging in a number of places. The rolls extend at least three inches on each side from the artwork and are drilled twice on each side. A rope loop is attached, which you can see in this image, and S-hooks secure the roll to the cage. The cage is an uneven surface, which I think you can see, and to prevent the roll from direct contact with the uneven cage, we created cradles out of epifoam. The cradles are not actually attached to the cage or the roll, but are pressure fitted and can be easily moved or shifted when necessary, which has happened a few times as things moved around in our special collections. Next, I wanted to describe a nesting or honeycomb storage system. This example is not from NYU Libraries, 
And I'm really grateful to Alan Balicki and the New York Historical Society for allowing me to share these images of the system they use. I think this is a great storage system that is relatively low cost housing solution for collections with many oversized materials such as large architectural drawing collections. The exterior tubes which form the frame are 6 inches in diameter. The center tube is 4.5 inches in diameter, and the inner tubes are 2 inch in diameter tubes. The system is used primarily to house architectural drawings and reproductions. Mel and X barrier sheets are used to isolate um, sensitive media such as blueprints. Polyethylene sleeves are used around the rolls to prevent abrasion as the tubes are removed and replaced after use. The sleeves also serve to protect the contents from dust and moisture. Each tube has a unique number which corresponds to an item level finding aid. And from what Alan has, has told me, this system's been in use for quite a while and has really um, held up and been really very popular with their librarians and archivists as this collection, parts of this collection is used really frequently. And here's another close up of the system that you can see the ethafoam cradles that again suspend the objects. The objects aren't coming in contact with the other tube. And that's again, you know, ethafoam. And in this instance, those are adhered to the neighboring tube um, with a hot melt glue. We have a number of objects that are very narrow, but also very, very long. A solution that we use for housing these objects is to roll them around the core also, either 4.5 inches or in this, um, image, we actually used a 3-inch core tube, and then place the rolls inside a standard record storage box. We try to use st standard size boxes whenever possible. To ensure that the rolls do not move in the box and are easy to access, access we built cradles to suspend the rolls. And I'm going to describe the process that we used to build the cradles in this picture. We chose to make um, blueboard cradles here, but also we could have used possibly ethophone. In this example, the cradles are constructed from B flute corrugated board, that's the bigger thickness. Um, three boards are scored to fo form boxes. Two boxes will form the cradles, and they're about two times the height of the roll. The third box provides the pressure to keep the cradles upright and measures the distance between the two cradles when placed inside a record storage box. And it's only about one and a half inches high. A notch is cut out of the cradle boxes to form a cradle. The notch accommodates at least a half of the roll, and meaning the core of the roll, the object is between the cradles. The three boxes are placed into the record storage box, and the roll with the object wrapped around is placed in the center. The objects do not come in contact with any of the boxes, and it's suspended. And here also we have wrapped the exterior of these rolls with uh, Melanex polyester sheets and tied with um, cotton thread. We could have also wrapped these in, in sometimes we used an unbuffered um, acid-free lignin-3 paper rather than the mylar. Moving on to much smaller objects, now I'll describe the method we use at NYU to store our collection of buttons and pins. Um, we have 4,000 plus and growing collection and we wanted to design something that really would allow as more buttons and pins come in to be easily rehoused into work. So um, the archivists also wanted a method that would really allow for increased use of this collection. They felt that it was underused partially because um, its housing did not permit easy access before, and they also wanted to improve security, something that they could really easily, um, you know, know how many buttons are on a, a placard before and, and after use. So we developed this method of creating placards that the buttons and pins could be directly attached to if their securing pin was intact and in good condition. Obviously, it does put some stress on the attaching pin. When securing the pin, if the securing pin is missing or it's compromised, we use polyethylene bags that are attached to the placards with a thread using a curved needle. Someone recently asked me if a stapler could also be used to secure the bagged pins on the placards, and I don't see why not. Although, you know, I would advise using a stainless steel staples. Although, personally, I prefer the needle and thread method. The placards are, are sized to fit horizontally into a standard record storage box. And it, it basically, they stack up on each other. So the placards are composed of a piece of B flute corrugated board, which is sandwiched between sheets of velar. We clip the corners so that the horizontally stored board, boards are really easy to lift out of the box without tipping, which could loosen a pin or a button. 
the lower velar sheets protects the surface of the buttons and pins on the adjacent placard. We secured the layers using you know, linen thread tackets. Again, you know, I prefer to sew when I can, but you could use some hot glue if you wanted to. This storage system has been really praised by our archivists who appreciate how it allows for viewing without any manipulation of the object. Moving on to photographs. Our collections include a large number of panoramic photographs, and uh, it seems that we get new ones quite frequently as well coming in with collections. Their format can pose a challenge for storage. Initially, the photographs were stored in folders and full flat file drawers, and we found there was way too much shifting of the photographs when opening and closing the drawers, plus it was really inefficient when we think about space. We experimented with making custom boxes for panoramic photographs, but rejected this method as the resulting boxes were really off, you know, awkward to shelve and use. The solution we developed employs dividers in the flat file drawers, which create compartments for the photographs. We use both horizontal and vertical dividers in a variety of widths. This method has allowed us to maximize the space in the flat file drawers, and the archivists have reported that they find the system easy to use. You know, although, again, these materials are actually pretty low use in general. The system can also be used to create dividers and flat files for other types of objects, and we are considering using this method for some um, large sort of panel artwork that we have, um, contemporary art that's plastic panels that we've been trying to figure out where to go because they don't really fit well in um, our standard size boxes, and we're, we're considering using this method for that. So it definitely has other applications outside of panoramic photograph storage. So here's a diagram on how we construct the dividers. We rely on pressure rather than adhesives to secure the systems. First, the dividers are made by scoring corrugated board. We use B flute. Then additional boards are cut to cre create the beds where the photographs lie. The panels fill out the spaces in the drawer tightly, which ensures that the dividers stay upright. We like the flexibility of the, the system offers and that we can adjust the widths of the storage areas just by plant changing the panels. And actually, we had to do that. The system was set up, and then after we did a major humidification, flattening, and treatment of a collection, we found that we had to adjust the panels to be a little bit wider. We needed one wider panel, um, and it was very easy to do. It was great. And to avoid any unevenness in the storage area, filler panels can be inserted. And you can see this on the slide in yellow. And again, all this is done without any adhesives, and it creates a nice flat plane. The less expensive alternative uses 20-point board, and is pictured in the lower area of the slide. Here, the dividers are constructed by wrapping a core of B flute with 20-point board and then using 20-point boards for the storage beds. This method may require the use of double stick tape or another adhesive to really prevent the collapse of the divider. So I did want to mention, if you do go for the 20-point, you may need to uh, think about using some sort of adhesives. Now I'll describe how we've been housing textile items in our collection. Um, this first slide is a bag with applique. You can see self-denial has been rehoused using custom-made pillow bumpers and a pillow inside these bags. These pillows are puffs, as we sometimes refer to them, were constructed with acid-free, non-buffered tissue only and use no adhesives. Some of the soft tissue is crumpled up to create the form that is needed, whether it's the internal pillow or the side bumpers. And then, the sh and then full sheets are wrapped and folded around to form these pillows and bumpers. It's a very quick and low-cost solution. And again, this object is in a standard size um, archival flat box that works well with our storage system. Now onto a little bit larger object. This is a motorcycle jacket and a hat, which was in really poor condition. It actually had a lot of mold and uh, was treated in the lab for that. The leather is very desiccated and there's a lot of cracking in many areas. The anticipated use of this object is very low, although it is an important object in our collection. The housing solution that we opted for employs, again, you're going to see some of these puffs and pillows, but a standard size oversized box. We constructed the, the puffs and pillows this time out of Tyvek exterior, and this supports the hat, which you can see, and also interior, which you can't see, inside of the arms and some of the body of the jacket are additional puffs, and this was to sort of prevent any more collapse and cracking um, of the leather. If this item had been a high-use item, we would have opted to make a large custom box that would have allowed for full display of the jacket and hat without any handling. Because as you can see, 
you know, there is some layering going on here. So if you really wanted to look at this um, jacket, you would need to remove it from the box to, to get a view at all the different patches, et cetera, that are attached to it. Um, but again, because the anticipated use was very low, we could opt for a standard size box. This slide illustrates how we construct the Tyvek pillows or puffs, which you saw in the last slide, and you'll see in coming up some more. Um, we use these both for interior and exterior supports. The Tyvek is first cut to size, either with a template or freehand, and then is sealed on three sides with an impulse sealer, which you can see pictured there. The interior of the puff we fill with unbuffered acid-free tissue, and then the open edge is sealed. You could use other materials to fill the inside of the puffs, such as, you know, unfused polyester batting. Um, we use the acid-free unbuffered tissue because we have a lot of it in stock. It's relatively inexpensive, and we feel comfortable with it. In addition, instead of using Tyvek, an unsized, unbleached cotton could be been used in the edges sewn on a machine. And it, actually, we have also used a sewing machine with Tyvek as well, especially for our larger applications. When you need to make something that's quite big, the um, impulse sealer can can be difficult to use, and Angela is actually going to be describing an instance where we did use that sewing machine for Tyvek um, next. And I'm actually now going to hand over my presentation to Angela Andres. Okay. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Please apologize, or I apologize for my, my froggy voice. I have a cold, um, the inevitable back-to-school cold. Okay, so um, now I am going to talk about the what we're calling the medium housings, um, which are moderately more complicated in either design or execution or the composition and nature of the objects being housed, or all three. So uh, this is a very, very large life-sized uh, theater prop, which clearly exceeds the dimensions of standard archival containers and it's quite unwieldy. Um, so it's also fairly heavy, so what we may on occasion construct a custom box for very large objects. This one was not a good candidate for a box because a box of that size would just be uh, way too heavy to be practical. So instead the object was filled with a large Tyvek puff, which you can see in the middle there, um, for interior support and then turned over and tied with cotton tape to a sheet of corrugated plastic, which is quite lightweight. And then it was placed inside of this large machine sewn Tyvek bag. And um, the, the underside of this bag, the back of it, is actually hard Tyvek and the top is soft Tyvek. Um, so you can use those two materials in combination with each other and they both um, work pretty well. Um, on a, on a sewing machine. Um, so it ha also has a, a drawstring closure with cotton ties that was machine sewn. And this object lives in the special collection storage room on its very own tabletop. It does require two people to properly remove and replace the bag. Um, but just because of this um, item's low anticipated use, this was not seen as um, a problem by the curators, this difficulty in access. Um, and just as a side note, see the, the image of the object there on the label? Uh, we really love to put clear images of objects on the housings that we create because it helps to reduce unnecessary handling. Um, we've all seen evidence in our collections of you know, bent folder edges or torn box lids that were caused by somebody trying to just get a peek inside without really removing the container from the shelf. Um, and adding an image to the, able, to the label takes away that mystery. So it keeps our containers intact, and it also ensures that fragile items don't get moved around more than they need to be. Okay, so these objects, um, this group of objects from an artist's personal effects, um, they sit in Tyvek lined cavities, which were carved out of an ethophone plank that was placed in the bottom of a standard record carton. And this is the original box that they had been stored in, but they were not adequately secured. Uh, the cavities can be cut with a hot or cold knife, as Laura mentioned before. Cold is definitely preferable in terms of health and safety. Um, and then they are lined with cotton or Tyvek as appropriate. In this case, it's Tyvek. So uh, whichever fabric you choose, um, the fabric is secured by being tucked into cuts that surround the cavities. 
And these are just a, just a slit that runs straight down through the, t the foam all the way around. Maybe in a half inch or inch is, is all, as far as you need to go. Um, the objects fit comfortably in these cavities, but it's not crucial that they fit exactly if the objects are stable, as these are. Um, so this, that means it can be a pretty quick and not a super high-skilled housing to execute. Um, and the bonus of reusing the original box means that there's no need to recatalog the objects because they're in their same container, and there's no disruption to the shelving order when they're replaced in the stacks after treatment. Okay, so here's another box that has um, a lined cavity, but it's formed a little differently. Um, a standard box in this case was not deep enough for the needs of this uh, housing, so we constructed a deeper custom box, but matched the same length and width as a standard box so that it will fit in well with its neighbors on the shelf. Um, and we have a little animation here that shows how the interior of the box was fitted out. So there's ethophone planks on the side, rolled tissue, more rolled tissue at the top and bottom, some tissue that was extra crumpled to make it soft, and then a little sling of Tyvek, and then our funny little object. Um, and I'll play that one more time so you can see it again. So the Tyvek in this case was secured in the same way as the other cavities. There's just a slit cut down the edge of each of those Tyvek, or those ethophone planks, and it's just tucked right in. So there's no adhesives involved here at all. No, definitely falls into the weird category. Okay, so um, this, uh, in this case also there's not shown here, a Tyvek puff was created, um, and I think this was a hand-sewn one because it will be used for presentation too. A Tyvek puff that is a, a rectangle that fits just inside the box, it rests on top of the object when the box is closed to um, secure the object, keep it from shifting, but then it also acts as a support for um, when the object is used for teaching. Okay, so this is a flat housing. It's meant um, to live in a flat file, um, but incidentally we've also done mats very similar to this one that have um, notched corners like the button placards that Laura talked about, uh, which can be stacked two or three or four deep in flat archival boxes. Um, so it, it can kind of go either way. Anyway, uh, inside this hinged folder is a kind of modified sink mat for a very fragile mounted photograph. So here is the mat, and you can see the hinged sides um, of the housing, these flaps which form the mat when they're closed. And there are uh, labels to indicate um, you know, how to access the print. And then here are kind of the flaps open to show you the guts of the housing. The photograph sits on this tray of gray 20-point uh, board, and it's held in place by pressure from these little pieces of velara, these little white squares and this bar here. Um, so you could also use mat board instead of velara. And this type of mat can also be really good for broken glass plate negatives. We've used it for that too. But in that case, you'll definitely want to use um, unbuffered board in place of the velara. So the tray and the photo can be removed from the housing if necessary. Um, but this housing designs encourage, encourages uh, nearly full access without the need for handling. With this photograph and with many others like it in this collection, which is from our university archives here, um, its mount was highly unstable, but the photo, you know, with the potential to cause damage to the photograph or the others, other photographs housed with it. Um, but the photograph itself was not considered to be a high demand object. So this housing solution secures the object and it heads off the possibility of damage that had been pretty much imminent in its prior state. So on to paintings. So NYU does not have uh, very many paintings, but there are um, some you know, framed paintings lurking about in special collections and corners of the stacks here and there. And as Laura mentioned, we do not have dedicated art storage. And so interim solutions have to be found until that happy day arrives. Um, for this fairly large painting, uh, two sheets of, 
uh, B flute corrugated board were um, joined together with a seam of Tyvek tape to make a single sheet that's big enough for a box. Um, a, a kind of a square of Valara was placed in the center to cushion the frame. Um, and again, if you had any concerns about Valara, you know, either causing a shine or a burnish on the frame or interacting in any way with either the, the painting media or the frame, then you could use an alternative such as felt for this cushion. Okay. This is our colleague and resident master of the framed painting sto uh, storage, Lou De Janeiro, and he's placing the painting um, in the box. Notice that it has a new backing board, a archival board, and uh, the, the large sheet of board that he's um, created has been cut into a kind of a cross shape with flaps that will wrap the painting. And there it is, all boxed up, tied with cotton ties, and almost ready to go. And there it is, with its nice little, you know, clearly labeled. Not only does it have a picture of the object, it's got directional arrows, which we love and think are very important. And it's ready to go back and safely await better days. Okay, so moving on to the complex housing, the real bang-up jobs. Um, while the majority of housing treatments that we do fall into the simple and the medium categories, there are times when we have to pull out all the stops, and the examples I'm going to show you here are all very high use items that definitely warranted uh, the full treatment. Okay, so I'm sure many of you have groups of objects in your collection that are housed together and maybe they were knocking around in whatever box was handy at the time that they were acquired or processed or maybe that's how they arrived in the collection. Um, this group of objects uh, either belonging to or associated with Charles Dickens in some way uh, were originally housed together in a record carton and the objects were wrapped in tissue but um, it wasn't entirely secure and the curators wanted a more stable and attractive housing that would both uh, protect and uh, present the objects in kind of a ooh, ah, sort of uh, candy box presentation. So here's a look at the empty box. Um, we used a standard art flat archival box, um, as we often do. We started with a template on uh, 20 point board um, on which all of the objects were traced uh, in the layout that you see here. And the box was built up in layers of B flute boards, a thicker corrugated board, that were cut from that template. So, for instance, the first layer had just one cutout for the shape of the, of the thickest, the deepest object, which is the one in the upper left there. And then the next layer of board uh, on top of that had cutouts for that object and for the next thickest object, which is the one in the lower right. And so on and so on, on up through the box with more cutouts in each successive layer until we get to the uppermost layer, which has a cutout for every single object. And even though this isn't the kind of treatment that we do every day, it's actually not as tedious or difficult um, as it would appear to build a multi-cavity box this way. Um, an alternative using cavities cut from ethofoam would probably be comparable in terms of the time to construct it. And ethofoam would um, probably be lighter, too, than the layered board. But in this case, where all the uh, objects are small and lightweight to begin with, the weight of the board isn't as much of an, as an issue as it would be if these were heavier objects. So most of the cavities are lined with soft Tyvek. Uh, but here you can see others are unlined, um, the little knife and the little theater token and things, and this uh, tie pin has its own little bed of Valara to rest in. Um, and we also used polyethylene straps here and here and here, as well as this little um, baggie to hold the coins. So the, the Dickens box is clearly a pretty rare treatment. Um, this one is, this, this box here is something similar, but uh, much scaled down. 
These are fragile case historic photographs. You can see them in the back there on that, on that plank of that the foam, a uh, daguerreotype and an ambrotype. Um, and they were not used very often because they were kind of poorly housed and not very accessible. And the curator wanted a more accessible housing that would enable her to more easily use them in her teaching. So starting with a standard flat box, again, love our standard boxes, the cavities were formed using scraps of ethafoam. And we try to save and reuse our scraps whenever possible to be both green and economical. Um, and then they were tacked together where they joined with just a dot of hot glue. You don't need much, just a little touch here and there. And then each cavity was filled to uh, the appropriate depth with uh, built up with scraps of blue board, corrugated board, I should say, uh, and then they were lined with soft Tyvek. And the Tyvek can be uh, adhered down under, underneath with either uh, double stick tape or, again, dots of hot glue, just a little tack, tack, tack all around. And uh, then the box is finished with this kind of window frame of corrugated board on top and these um, straps of hard Tyvek to help gently lift out the objects. Okay, so now we have a custom housing for a very large firearm, this uh, four foot long rifle from the Spanish Civil War. And the Spanish Civil War is a very popular area of research at our Tamament Library, and so this rifle is a pretty unique piece in the collection used pretty often in teaching, and it had previously been stored in a long, uh, very battered, oblong cardboard box, which was uh, awkward to handle and not at all protective to the object. So we started with a template, a very precise tracing of the rifle's shape um, on 20-point board, and even though the strap of the rifle was unfortunately broken, that made our job a bit easier here because we could just bundle it up nice and neat um, with polyethylene straps next to the barrel. So we built a custom um, B flute corrugated box for this object because it's obviously just so far outside the standard sizes. And this is um, a pizza box a hint with a hinge lid as opposed to a, a two-piece, you know, a bottom and a separate lid. And we filled the box with at the foam planks. These are two-inch at the foam planks. Uh, traced the rifle template onto the foam. They just use a Sharpie to, to outline it. And then we really, really wanted a snug fit for this. And unlike those uh, objects that we saw earlier, we wanted this to really nest tightly in its um, cavity. So we used a heated cutting tool with interchangeable elements, used the fine tips for these um, details, like the tip of the, of the barrel there, and you know these little, de these little bits, and then switched out to this larger round tool to scoop out the large areas of the cavity. And we tested the fit along the way by placing the rifle in the cavity you know, every now and then to see how the fit was going. And when it was just right, um, we placed a sheet of soft Tyvek over the cavity, put the rifle back in to make sure that the Tyvek formed really well to the shape of the cavity. And the Tyvek was trimmed to about maybe an inch, three quarters inch, all the way around. And uh, as we saw in the cavity housings before, a slot was cut all the way around the, uh, the edge of the cavity, about a quarter inch out. And a fine micro spatula was used just to tuck that extra flap of Tyvek in. And the uh, ethafoam is so dense that the no adhesive is needed here. The pressure of the ethafoam keeps it in there. And there's the, the finished housing. Um, it's, it's a nice, a nice snug fit. The rifle rests a little more than halfway down into the cavity. Um, so although this box is obviously very large, it's longer than four feet now, um, it's much easier for one person to handle than the previous box had been because the object is held so snugly in place that 
the balance isn't constantly shifting when you're holding it. And also on the inside of the lid, you can't see in this picture, but when the lid is closed, there are ethophone bumpers at a couple of points inside the lid, and they uh, provide an extra measure of protection against shifting when the box is closed. Okay, this is our big finish. We really like this guy. We call him Wolfie. Um, he's big, he's bulky, and he's definitely weird. Um, he's a large paper mache wolf's head. It's part of a very popular collection. It's heavily used in teaching and research. And so like the Dickens and rifle boxes, its housing uh, has to protect it, but to also uh, facilitate and even encourage access. Um, as Laura mentioned at the beginning of the talk, one of the goals that we try to achieve in housings, especially with objects that uh, patrons are not permitted to handle, is to present the objects in such a way that the user's experience isn't diminished by that prohibition. So we and the curators too really want the housing to uh, invite the user into the object's story rather than sending a, a prohibitive don't touch kind of message. Um, and since the, the front of this box is open, it's a little hard to see, but this in the, in the foreground here you can see that the, this is the drop front of the box and it's flat on the table, or flaps on the side. And the object and all of its supports sit on this platform of a sheet of corrugated board, I think it's B-flute, lined with quarter-inch Bellara. And it's got these ties here, these loops that you can use to uh, fully remove the, the platform from the box so you can get a complete 360 viewing of it. So here is the closed box. This is the front side uh, with the flaps, and there are uh, magnets embedded inside the flap to keep them closed when, um, when the box is, is uh, stored on the shelf. The pressure of the lid also aids in, in keeping that, that big flap um, nice and snug and tight. So again, we love our pictures, our arrows, and there's a, since this is a, a little more complicated box than most, there's some um, very detailed instructions here on how to use the box and access Wolfie. So this is a look at the ethophone pillars that support the ears. And the, because the ears are uh, asymmetrical, the, the pillars are differently sized to accommodate the, you know, the, the quirks of each ear. Um, you can also see these Velara bumpers. Uh, there's no adhesive there. They're just layered up, you know, shaped and curved as necessary to conform to the wolf. And they're tacked onto the platform with linen thread. And those encircle the wolf all the way around. And they just hold the wolf head on that platform with a nice light pressure. And here are some more details. Um, so there's the more Velar bumpers all the way around right here. Um, you can see the channels that are cut into those ethophone pillars to really snugly uh, hug those ear edges, and they're lined with um, soft Tyvek. You know, ethophone is very rigid, but when you the cut edges tend to be a little bit scratchy, so that Tyvek smooths out that surface. And the pillars are removable; they slide right out. But these um, little ethophone, kind of C-shaped ethophone ports support the pillars when they're um, supporting the ears. And then over on the right, there is um, more ethophone inside that black pillar. It's, black, it's ethophone that's wrapped in black velara. Um, so it's held in place by the object's own weight. And the black velara really allows this to be much more visually integrated into the object than the stark white would be. Uh, the teeth and tongue are particular points of interest on this piece. And it's nice to, um, you know, that the black foam doesn't really distract much from that. Okay, that's almost it for us. So here is a list of the items from NYU Special Collections and Archives that we featured in our slides. And uh, we thank the curators for their permission to use the images of these pieces. And of course, for their uh, enthusiastic cooperation and collaboration with us uh, in our work um, all the time. And if you want to learn more about any of these objects, 
or about the special collections here at NYU, there's a link up at the top to the home page. And I'm going to hand it back to Laura. Thanks, Angela. Um, just a final slide. Uh, Earlier today when I was going through the presentation, it occurred to me that you know we talk a little bit about making custom boxes, but we hadn't really gone into that, so we added this slide at the end. And this shows, um, it's from our manual, we have a lab procedure manual, and it's a two-piece corrugated board, so this would be a separate um, top and bottom. And, uh, and I hope it's useful to folks there. And if you have any questions about that diagram or any of the other procedures, I mean, we're ready to answer your questions now. But also, please, um, you know, you, you're going to have our email address, and our, you're more than welcome to uh, contact us about that. And also, we were just sort of curious, and you can put this into the questions. Uh, if you'd like to, you can add, uh, what is the uh, biggest, bulkiest, or weirdest object you have in your collection? Uh, we're just sort of curious for fun. But anyway, we're ready for questions. Thank you, Laura and Angela. It was interesting to see the variety of things you have there. So yeah, as um, Laura pointed out, now is the time for questions, so go ahead and add those in. And while people are doing that, let me get us started with a question. I'm really interested in the kind of training you provide. It seems like you're doing a lot of specialty things. So are you doing training of employees in your department to, to do this kind of work? Um, well, we, we do two different types of training. One is we definitely work a lot with the special collections and all the staff who work there. They have a pretty um, large student staff, and we do a lot of training with them on handling and care of materials and how to properly kind of access these materials that we rehouse. That's a you know a big part of uh, one of our colleagues' jobs. He's a preservation archivist. He is a trained conservator, Fletcher Durant. Um, so that's one part of the training we do. We also do a lot of outreach to um, the our students who are learning um, about archives. We have a public history archive program at NYU um, where we do teach some basic box making uh, of those students. Uh, it's a half-day course we offer for our NYU uh, students. Does that answer your question? Yes. So when you get something in, do you all stand around brainstorming about what kind of um, housing to create? Or, or do you just have it, do you have things figured out so well now that it's clear-cut? I think um, that's a great question. Uh, I think a kind of combination of it. I mean, we are, you know, it's a lab environment, so you know we interact a lot, and uh, we don't really treat anything in isolation in terms of how our working practice is. We're very much a team, and we do a lot of reviewing of the materials, both with the curators and then with each other. I think at this point we have. Um, some techniques that we really like. We talked about the puffs and the pillows, but also the sort of lined epiphone um, sort of cavity creations. I, I think that it's, it's a bit of both, but we definitely really rely on, on each other. And it's a you know, real back and forth process. We're also always trying to challenge ourselves a little bit. Um, one thing that you know, Angela wasn't able to get to in the wolf housing, we had actually initially kind of created that housing in 2006. And at that point, we were very new here, and it didn't really necessarily come to terms with this, how often it was going to be used, and also size things. And we had made the box a little bit bigger, kind of just thinking, oh, it would be good to have some area around it. And then just this year, we revisited the housing and found that actually we needed to make the box a little smaller, because it would fit onto a particular shelf easier. And, and so you know, we definitely try to interact and, and to rethink things whenever possible. OK. So let's see, UCF's biggest object is their mascot's uniform. Ah, knight, I don't knight doubt it. Knight rule the knight, two helmets, two swords, chest plate, shoulder plates, calf plates, shoes, etc. OK, That's wow. Interesting. Yes, mascots. You know, we don't have any of the original NYU uh, mascot, but apparently it was a, it, people would dress up as a violet. We were the fighting violets until we were renamed the Bobcats, which was actually a little NYU trivia, named after our um, library system. So Okay. Okay, here's a question. Could you talk a bit more about why you don't use PVA in housing plastic objects? Um, well, I think I also avoid PVA in, uh, with photographs. 
and also with architectural drawings because, I mean, there is a concern that when PVA um, cures, when it dries, that it releases acetic acid. Um, you can, and, you know, often we use it a lot in fabricating, you know, cloth cover drop spine boxes. You know, you can allow it to sort of air out and firmly dry. Um, over time, you know, and again, it's one of these moments of risk, you know, does it really present a true risk? I'm not 100% certain, but I have enough concern that I would rather use materials that I feel 100% confident with, with when I'm dealing with sensitive media. So that could be deteriorating plastics. Often when I'm dealing with plastics, I don't know. I, rarely, sometimes, you know, it's, we have a wonderful relationship with the Institute of Fine Arts Conservation Center. And if we have students working on a particular material, they might be able to do some analytic testing. And then I do know what plastic it is. But sometimes I do have to be concerned that there might be cellulose acetate, which would definitely, um, with that, you know, possible acetic acid you know, um, off-gassing could really uh, impact its its uh, conservation. Okay. And what kind of hot glue do you use? Oh, um, I had this written down. You know, it is it's from Gaylord Brothers, and it is the only type that they sell. Um, so, um, actually, here I did write it down. It is the Thermo Grip three six three six. It's an ethylene vinyl acetate copolymer. And I think, as Angela mentioned it, we use it really sparingly. Um, you know, I know a lot of times in large natural history collections, you know, they really rely on hot glue a lot and have to make a lot of these housings. I just, you know, we use it when we have to, but uh, we really try to use needle and thread whenever we can or pressure. Okay. Can you talk a little bit more about why you're using the rolls as opposed to flat storage? Yeah, I would love to have um, larger flat storage. Uh, at this point, with the furniture that we have, the largest flat storage we have is about 50 inches. So anything larger than 50 inches, we have to come up with an alternative um, for. Okay. And um, another thing, you know, we'll say is that in the past, people had stored, you know, lar objects larger than that on the top of shelving or on the top of a base of flat files, and we have found a lot of damage to those objects. So, although I don't love necessarily storing some of our objects rolled. I, I do worry on some of the more brittle, heavier supports. Um, it's just, you know, until we have proper large flat files or other types of dedicated flat storage for objects larger than 50 inches, we store things rolled when we have to. Okay, so you would have preferred the flat. For some of these objects, I, mean, I think some of it when you're talking about a, you know, 100 inch long kind of thing, you know, you're not going to be able to really store that flat. Um, I also prefer to use as large as possible core as I can, but I am limited by um, the spaces I have. I couldn't really use a 12-inch core, you know, and hang them off of those uh, crates that would just get into the hallway. So we are working within the confines of our space and our resources, too, to be honest. I mean, you know, when you start getting to the larger cores, you know, the price of those cores gets really expensive. Okay. Well, let me ask one last question here, sure. since we're running out of time. You mentioned that you don't have art storage. So what would that look like? I mean, ideally, when we are actually, very exciting news for us that we are looking into art storage, and I'm hoping that'll happen. It would probably be a separate facility for us, because we don't have much room here in Lower Manhattan to, you know, to build that. But it would probably be like, you know, large racks where you would hang paintings. I mean, paintings ideally are stored hung, um, as opposed to boxed up. Uh, and uh, I would also, but maybe would have bins, either, you know, the hanging racks or bins where those, uh, paintings could go into, and also I would love to have just sort of large, you know, shelving where we could really put things and not always have to worry about um, space considerations, just kind of more big, you know, warehouse style shelving that when we have large objects that are frequently used, we could build, you know, large boxes for them or crate them, you know, store things crated would be great for some objects but if good. they're not used a lot. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. It was oh, just so interesting you. to see all those options you, 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 you're using. Well, thank you. Thanks, thanks our, everybody. Oh, sorry. To all <laughs> our attendees, thank you for joining us today. We trust you found it useful. And just a reminder, you will be getting a copy of a link to the recording, the slides, and an evaluation form. So please do fill out that evaluation form because we use that to plan other webinars and events. So we do have several webinars coming up. Uh, in October, we have a two series, Standards for Collection Management, and one on podcasts. And we end October with Creating Holistic User Experiences. 
In November, we have one of our Spanish webinars on RDA relationships. And not yet posted, we have two webinars, one on altmetrics and another one on authority records. And in December, we are rounding out this um, fall with copywriting of data and use of social media. Also, don't forget we have e-forums, which are two-day discussions. And in October, we have one on open access and our web courses. So you'll find all of that on the Alex website. So I want to thank people who worked behind the scenes to make this webinar possible. Catherine Balick, Julie Reese, and Emily Whitmore. You know, without their technical support, we wouldn't be able to do this. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, and we hope to see you in future events.